This is the age of creation. Think about it. Everyone is out there on the internet making something. No longer do we just watch YouTube videos. We make them. No longer do we just read blogs. We write them. Yes, yes, you either got a great idea or you probably know someone who does. And when it's time to move that idea from your head to the screen in front of you, that's where Squarespace comes in. It's the perfect web tool to help you fashion the internet into whatever you want it to be. Maybe the hands-on site with loads of opinions and ideas about what exactly your website should look like. If so, very cool. Squarespace gives you all the customization options you could ever want with no updates, no patches, no technical BS to worry about. Or maybe you just need something functional, something that works with minimal thought so you can stay focused on the content and not the coat of paint. Well, then just use one of their quick, beautiful templates to make a website that's both fresh and simple. Now, once you're done setting up your website, locking in the name, maybe playing with some of the colors. There are so many extra features that Squarespace provides so your website can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support, everything you could ever want in one place. So when you're ready to get started on the next web project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, it's got to be with Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com for search brain food to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now today's video. In North America, some 172,000 homicides are committed every year. The motive for these murders varies widely from crimes of passion to gangland turf wars to robberies and petty arguments gone wrong. In the past, however many murders were committed for a much more banal and cynical reason, insurance fraud. It's previously covered in our video, a murder mystery, an airline bombing, and the last to hang in Canada, life insurance policies used to be disturbingly easy to take out on a person without their knowledge, meaning a suitably unscrupulous person could potentially cash in big time, provided their victim's death could be made to look like an accident. But for one cabal of would-be fraudsters in 1930s New York City, the supposedly easy scam proved far more than they bargained for, as their intended victim managed to shrug off a series of increased increasingly desperate attempts to remove him from this plane of existence. This is the incredible and absurd story of Iron Mike Malloy, the most unkillable person in history. Our story begins in 1932, a period of US history lodged squarely between the tail end of prohibition and the darkest depths of the Great Depression. At the time, the unemployment rate in New York City had climbed to nearly 50%, leaving tens of thousands of residents jobless and desperate. Among these was Michael Malloy, a 60-year-old Irishman from County Donegal living in New York's Bronx neighborhood. A former firefighter, chronic alcoholism had prevented Malloy from holding down a steady job, and by the early 1930s, he was living as a homeless drunk spending most of his waking hours drifting from speakeasy to speakeasy and taking occasional jobs as a janitor to feed his liquid diet. He was, as an editorial in the Daily Mirror later put it, part of the flotsam and jetsam in the swift current of underworld speakeasy life, those no longer responsible derelicts who stumble through the last days of their lives in a continual haze of bowery smoke. Among the many speakeasies frequented by Malloy was one at 3804 Third Avenue, owned by Anthony Tony Marino. At first, Malloy, who would sit at the bar from sunup to sundown, knocking back endless shots of whiskey, was welcomed as a local customer. But when it became clear that Malloy had no intention of ever paying his ever-mounting bar tab, he found himself cut off and banned from the free lunch tray. Yet Malloy continued to hang around, bumming drinks off the speakeasies, more affluent patrons with his rambling anecdotes and boisterous Irish charm. All of this changed one evening in January 1933 as Marino was conferring with four of his closest associates. Joseph Murphy, a former chemist now working as a bartender in the speakeasy, Frank Pasqua, an undertaker who ran a funeral parlor on East 117th Street in Manhattan, taxicab driver Hershey Harry Green, and grocer Daniel Kreisberg. The mood among the five men was grim. The worsening Great Depression was cutting ever deeper into the speakeasy's business, pushing Marino to the brink of financial ruin. It was then that Frank Pasqua spotted the figure of Mike Malloy slumped across the bar, and he had a brainwave. Why not kill the old drunk and collect on his life insurance, turning a liability into a handsome payday? 
Marino was enthusiastic. After all, the group pulled off the same scam once before. In the spring of 1932, the five men had conspired to take out an $800 insurance policy on Marino's then girlfriend's one, Miss Betty Carlson. Then, one cold night, Marino plied Miss Carlson with liquor until she was blackout drunk and then escorted her back to her apartment, where he stripped her naked, doused her in water, and left her by an open window. The next morning, she was found dead. Conveniently, the coroner gave the cause of death as pneumonia, allowing Marino and company to collect on the insurance. Killing Malloy, the men figured would be even easier on account of his advanced age and his alcoholism with Pasqua pointing out he looks all in he ain't got much longer to go anyhow the stuff is getting him the dastardly plan in hand the five men entered a new agreement which the press would later dub the murder trust the first order of business would be to take out a life insurance policy on malloy without his knowledge well far easier than today this was still far from a straightforward process and accounts differ as to just how the murder trust accomplished this feat according to one version of events Frank pasqua recruited an unnamed accomplice to pose as nicholas mellory a stand in for mike malloy and together the pair secured the services of an unscrupulous insurance agent another version of the story has the murder trust tricking an inebriated malloy into signing the insurance papers under the guise of a petition to elect tony marino to local office whatever the case the trust succeeded in obtaining three insurance policies totaling three thousand five hundred seventy six dollars or around seventy thousand dollars in today's money all three policies contained a double indemnity clause meaning double the value would be paid out if the insured suffered an accidental death nicholas merrily aka mike malloy's age was given as 45 to cut down insurance premiums while bartender joseph murphy was named next of kin and beneficiary the rest of the murder trust would receive their shares later from murphy's payout next gained the task of actually killing malloy this the trust assumed would be the easy part they had only to let the whiskey flow freely and the old souse would quickly drink himself into the grave there was only one catch after months of being cut off mallory might grow suspicious at suddenly having his tab reopened as luck would have it however new york speakeasies were engaged in a bit of price war allowing marino to explain away his sudden extension of unlimited credit as a way of remaining competitive and retaining a loyal customer he even provided his victim with a mattress in the back of the bar to sleep off his hangovers malloy as expected took to this arrangement like a fish to water the murder trust gleefully rubbed their hands eagerly awaiting the moment when he would finally drink his last unfortunately malloy's liver hardened by a lifetime of drinking proved more resilient than the murder trust had anticipated and despite knocking back enough whiskey to fill the east river mike malloy remained very much alive forcing marino and his accomplices to rethink their strategy joseph murphy drawing on his knowledge of chemistry suggested that they try methanol or wood alcohol then commonly used as car antifreeze as covered in our previous video can you really make yourself immune to poison by taking tiny doses over time and the forgotten plague during prohibition when methanol is ingested an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase metabolizes it first into formaldehyde and then into formic acid this attacks the nervous system and inhibits cellular respiration leading to permanent blindness coma and eventually death but while as little as 15 milliliters of methanol is enough to kill a grown man mike malloy cheerfully pounded back gallons of the stuff with seemingly no ill effects malloy's remarkable resistance to methanol likely resulted from him consuming regular ethanol alongside the poison shots ethanol is preferentially metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase allowing the methanol to be harmlessly excreted by the body indeed ethanol is one of the the most common and effective treatments for methanol poisoning having struck out twice the murder trust tried spiking malloy's drinks with increasingly toxic substances including turpentine horse liniment and even rat poison but all to no avail mallory's iron gut withstood them all having once allegedly seen a man die after eating fresh oysters and whiskey frank pasqua left some oysters out in the sun until they were completely spoiled soaked them in methanol and then gave them to malloy when this attempt also inexplicably failed the increasingly baffled and exasperated murder trust concocted the ultimate deadly snack a rotten sardine sandwich garnished with a nasty combination of carpet tags broken glass and metal shavings malloy downed the meal with relish licked his fingers and knocked back several more shots of methanol before stumbling out of the door and heading home at last confident of victory marino and his accomplices eagerly awaited news of malloy's death either from food poisoning or stomach hemorrhage but the following afternoon the speakeasy door swung open and guess who walked in well it was no other than mike malloy still very much alive and hungry for another sardine and carpet tack sandwich apparently it was by now clear to the murder trust that nothing they could feed malloy could possibly kill him so they turned to a method which had served them well before 
hypothermia. One particularly cold night, when temperatures dipped to minus 26 Celsius, Marino and Murphy served Malloy drinks until he passed out, bundled his unconscious body into Harry Green's taxi, and drove him to Claremont Park. There, they stripped Malloy naked, dumped him in the snow, and doused him in water, and left him to freeze to death. When the following morning, Malloy failed to show up at the speakeasy, the murder trust scoured the local papers for news of his death. They found none. Yet the gang remained optimistic. After all, it would take some time for the police to discover the body. But this hope was dashed the following morning as Mike Malloy staggered once more through the speakeasy door, seemingly reinvigorated and wearing a brand new set of clothes. Shortly after being dumped, Malloy had been discovered by the police, who took him to a welfare organization where he was fed and reclothed. With seemingly no memory of how he ended up in the park, Malloy ordered his first drink of the day and cheerfully returned to his usual routine. Realizing they were completely out of their depth, the murder trust decided to call in an expert, mob hitman Anthony Tough Tony Bastone. The following night, Bastone, Marino, and Harry Green once again bundled the semi-conscious Malloy into Green's taxi, drove him to the deserted intersection of Baychester Avenue and Gun hill road and attempted to run him over but on the first attempt the irritatingly lucky malloy managed to wander out of the way so green missed him so for the second attempt marino and bastone held malloy still in the middle of the road while green barreled towards him only jumping clear at the last moment this time the car struck true malloy flying like a rag doll over the hood and landing in a pile on the pavement there his assassins left him as they fled back to marino's speakeasy to celebrate the victory the next day brought no sign of malloy nor the next nor the one after that after two weeks had passed, the murder trust was confident Malloy had finally gone to the great speakeasy in the sky, but they would have to prove it to the insurance companies. The gang scoured the newspaper obituaries for news of Malloy's death. They found none. They phoned every hospital and morgue in the city. Still, no Malloy. The old drunk had seemingly vanished from the face of the earth, and with him the murder trust chances of a handsome payday. With Bastone's patience running thin, he suggested that they find another bum, run him over, identify him as Malloy, and collect the insurance money. The murder trust duly found a suitable target, a regular patron named Joe Murray, and proceeded to repeat their caper, running over a drunken Murray with Green's taxi and stuffing Malloy's identity papers into his pocket. But Murray proved just as durable as Malloy, and despite his injuries, he made a full recovery within two months. Adding insult to injury, three weeks after his disappearance, Mike Malloy himself stumbled into Marino's speakeasy, seemingly none the worse for wear. He apologized for his absence, explaining that he'd been in a car accident and suffered a concussion and a broken shoulder. The hospital, it turned out, had simply forgotten to list him as a patient. Then, as if nothing had happened, Malloy took his usual seat at the bar and ordered his first drink. By now, the murder trust's patience had run out. There would be no half measures this time. Whatever it took, Mike Malloy would die. Thus, on February the 22nd, 1933, Joseph Murphy and Daniel Kreisberg dragged an unconscious Malloy to Murphy's apartment on Fulton Avenue. As Murphy laid Malloy on the bed, Kreisberg connected a rubber hose to the apartment's coal gas jet and stuffed the other end into Malloy's mouth, holding it there until Malloy's face went purple and he stopped breathing. After shrugging off nearly 20 attempts on his life, the indestructible iron Mike Malloy was finally dead, done in by carbon monoxide poisoning. The next day, the murder trust paid corrupt coroner and ex-alderman Dr. Francis Manzella to write the death certificate. Manzella gave the cause of death as low bar pneumonia, with alcoholism as a contributing factor. Frank Pasqua then took care of the funeral arrangements, burying Malloy in a $10 pine coffin and a $12 plot in the pauper's section of Burncliff Cemetery in Westchester. Meanwhile, Murphy collected the $800 payout from Metropolitan Life and distributed it among the murder trust conspirators. Despite the absurd lengths that they'd been forced to go to, the gang, it seemed, had succeeded in pulling off the perfect crime. But as you might have noticed, Marino and his accomplices were hardly criminal masterminds, and before long they began breaking the first two rules of murder trust. Do not talk about murder trust. Fueled by the gang's indiscreet talk, rumors of Mike the Durable began to circulate in speakeasies all around town, eventually reaching the ears of the Bronx police. At the same time, agents from the Prudential Life Insurance Company sought out Joseph Murphy to hand him his insurance payout, only to discover he was in jail on unrelated charges. This raised suspicions among the agents, who duly contacted the police. When officers investigated and uncovered that an actual Iron Mike Malloy had died on February the 22nd with multiple life insurance policies taken out in his name, they ordered his body exhumed and autopsy. Medical examiners quickly determined that Malloy had actually died of carbon monoxide poisoning and that the death certificate was falsified. From here, the whole plot quickly unraveled. A professional hitman told investigators that Marino and his accomplices had tried to hire him to kill Malloy, but found his $500 fee too expensive, while Harry Green, who had been denied his full share of the insurance payout, began cooperating with police in exchange for a lighter sentence. 
Finally, investigators learned of the mysterious death of Miss Betty Carlson, whose life insurance policy named Tony Marino as a beneficiary. Based on this overwhelming evidence, the five core members of the murder trust were arrested and charged with murder, with Dr. Francis Monzella being held as an accessory after the fact. The conspirators were tried at the Bronx County Courthouse, the jury deliberating for five hours before returning a verdict. Harry Green and Dr. Manzella received lengthy prison sentences, while Tony Marino, Joseph Murphy, Frank Pasqua, and Daniel Kreisberg were sentenced to death. The four conspirators met their end in the electric chair at New York Sing Sing Prison. Kreisberg, Marino, and Pasqua were executed on the 7th of June, and Murphy on the 5th of July, 1934. Meanwhile, Iron Mike Malloy, the seemingly unkillable Rasputin of the Bronx, passed into New York legend, one of the many absurd characters in the folklore of the city that never sleeps. While the names Marino Murphy, Pascal Kreisberg, and Green have faded from memory, Mike Malloy lives on his memory as indestructible in death as he was in life. <laughs>